Welcome to the Fail Forward podcast. The purpose of this podcast is change the negative stigma around failure into a positive. Failure is only a negative if we do not learn from it and we give up. Welcome back to the Fail Forward podcast. My vision is to help people overcome the fear of failure so they can live their goals and dreams. And as you guys know, I always talk about the importance of knowing your numbers and how that was actually one of the main things I didn't know when I lost it all a few years ago. So I've got the wonderful Julie Wong with me today. She is a business coach and finance mentor. She helps people with the numbers in their business. So welcome to the show, Julie. Thank you, Henry. Thanks for having me on. Amazing, amazing to have you here. And I'm really looking forward to getting uh, into it, into the numbers, talking about numbers and really helping people understand why numbers are important in their business. So tell me, Julie, how did you come about to get to where you got to now? Take us back as far as you need to go to sort of explain your journey of of where you started and, and how you got into this world. Um, I'm slightly an accidental accountant. Um, I actually started life off wanting to be a dentist since I was 10 years old. Um, But then I got to university, did a year of dentistry, and then I ended up flipping into a business degree instead. So I actually did accounting, didn't really love it, graduated, got offered a job in the interview, and it's like, oh my God. So I just took it out of fear, um, and I became a chartered accountant off the back of that. And yeah, so I worked with loads of different businesses, and the bit I loved most was actually chatting to the clients, you know, and the people doing at the coalface and what their problems were. And I used to love it, going like, yeah, but have you thought about doing like this? And so that didn't really, like, you know, resonate with me, you know, after I left. And I I tried lots of different um, finance jobs in different industries. I've been in property, I've been in banking, I've been in not for profit. So I've covered a really wide range of um, industries and different roles, but it's always been a very commercial. Um, roles rather than being in the back office doing the statutory accounts because having been an auditor I thought I never want to be answerable to an auditor so, <laughs> yeah. so I thought yeah let's just work on the numbers that actually make it happen so it's all about budgeting being commercial you know seeing where the business is profitable working alongside um, you know product guys especially when I was in banking we used to work out what the products that were deliverable to the clients and whether it's going to be profitable for the business um, and useful for the clients at the end of the day so that was really really useful um, so I think you know my classical route is well my route is not classical um, as an accountant I, I say that I've walked more as much distance sideways as those who've walked it like upwards up the sort of the normal traditional finance director CFO route but I think that just resonates with me. It just makes me feel like that is me. I just love diversity and that's what interests me. So about four years ago, um, uh, a friend of mine asked me to collaborate with her um, and we, I was at a, you know, we pitched for some work with the British Library, ended up being um, on the British Library programme delivering the finance um, workshops. And so, you know, Susie was the lead on that um, and I learned from her. And then also I was delivering workshops um, with the Wolverhampton University they have a startup program um, called Speed, and both these programs are ERDF funded, so sadly they both come to an end. Um, but British Library now has one, um, which is um, Arts Council funded for creatives. But I realised that, you know, it was during lockdown, where we were all doing the, the sessions on Zoom. I came off the Zoom and then we were like, Julie, you're just not a classical accountant. That was really, really useful. That was not the kind of conversation I was expecting with an accountant. I was just like, literally, like, hey! I was just really, really, really happy to be useful, to be relevant, and I'm, I love marketing. So yeah, that pulled together all the different elements. So just to go back to get people to understand, because some people probably won't understand classical accounting, what do you mean between the difference between what you were doing and, and the sort of classical accounting? I think a lot of people, their especially the sort of smaller businesses, their experience of accountants um, are when they do their VAT returns or when they do their tax returns and they speak to them you know, every quarter um, or every year. Um, and those who speak to them like regularly seem to be, you know, fewer and far between. Um, so it's not understanding what a value sort of finance can bring to people. So, you know, quite often I say that accountants are very guilty of sitting opposite their clients, waggling their finger and saying, you should have done this and you should have done that, rather than saying, actually, where can I help you? What don't you understand? Because a lot of people just don't understand what a profit and loss is, what the balance sheet actually means and you know what the value of actually managing your cash or even how to manage your cash or how to create a budget and how to actually understand i mean i call budgets just the road map of mapping out where you want to go to in your business because you might have your vision of like oh i want to conquer the world or you know i want to conquer this industry i want to be a lead but what does it actually mean in numbers and until you convert it to numbers it's really really hard to track words and pictures so for me a strategy is just 
uh, your roadmap in numbers. I love that. And I, and I have my fair challenges with accountants. And you're right, like uh, even the guys that I mentor now on the tree surgery mastermind, a lot of them are like, well, my accountant just gives me my VAT return every three months. Um, I have no idea what my profit is. Um, what's a balance sheet? Um, and I've had my fair share of accountants that do similar stuff. And it's only that we've had to move to different accountants. And also now that I know I need to know my profit and loss, my balance sheet, my cash flow, that we then are challenging the accountants we're going to, to be able to get that. So the, I suppose my question would be is, is do you think it needs to be more responsibility on the, on the accountants or do you think it all comes down to the business owner? No, I think it's a two-way process because you don't know what you don't know. And the thing is, is that, you know, it's, it's all, it can be real, it's real jargon at the end of the day. And I try and keep it simple. I mean, there's an element of jargon that you have to learn and understand. Um, because in the same way business owners learn what they do, you know, in tree surgery, there's certain terminology that you've got to learn to communicate to your clients as to what you're going to do when you go and turn up at, at their place. And so you've got to get them on board to understand what's going to happen so that there is a, an alignment of expectations. It's a management of the, of, of the, you know, the expectations gap. And I think accountants need to understand that too. And business owners need to step up to the plate and go, actually, I don't understand what you're saying explain to me so whenever i get any workmen in or whatever it is i put it up on myself to ask questions like, i don't get what you're doing saying explain to me and then i'll understand what you're doing so it is a two-way process and it is a language i mean finance is a language you know you as a business owner you'll learn about marketing you'll learn about you know seo you'll learn about um uh, conversion rates and things like that so you're very willing to learn about the marketing terminology i think business owners need to own up and say i need to learn about financial um technology uh, you know financial um vocabulary and how to manage it yeah I, I completely agree some some of the guys that come on the mastermind with me um you know we we can set out oh i can tell them how to market i can tell them to go and spend a certain amount on pay-per-click i can get the say to them go, go and do this go and pay for this go and pay for that but then I say, but actually, what, what's your profit and loss for last month? Because there's no point in me telling you to go and spend three grand, drop three grand on Facebook ads and, and pay-per-click and their profit's £1,000 because they're just going to end up in a in a bad place. So, um, and it is the challenge um, because a lot of people just think market, 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 everything will be all right. Marketing does solve quite a few problems, but if you've not got the numbers to back it up, then it's going to be a challenge, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I now have this little analogy um, around why finance is really important. And this goes back to like the roadmap, et cetera. So I, how I perceive it is that every business owner has a destination for their business to how they're going to get there, what they're going to do. And the way they're going to get there is a business to get to their destination. So that is a bit like having your car to get to your destination. So if you think of your business as your vehicle, you, you know, how it looks like is the, and the color of it is like the branding and the marketing. That's your business, how, it's, how people look at it. In order to get you from here to your destination, you need fuel. So in the same way a business to run needs revenue. So think of your revenue as being the fuel to your business. How well your business operates is like the engine and the, you know, all the, all the mechanics of it. The better your business runs, the smoother your journey will be. So you've got to get the processes right, you know, your delivery process, you know, delivery to your clients right. That is the operational part of it. And then, then to get to where you want to go to, the strategy bit is your Google Maps. So if you map that out, you know where you're going to, you know where, you know, resources you need, what the milestones are going to be, that is your business budget, you know, your financial plan. And because everything you do in business has a financial impact when you turn on the light in the morning, whether you answer an email, don't answer an email because you could be losing a sale. It all shows up in your finances. So I think of finances being like the steering wheel or perhaps your co-driver. It tells you whether you're going in the right direction to where you want to go to. And then you have your dashboard in front of you telling you whether your business is operating effectively, whether you're running out of fuel, whether you're going in the right direction. And if you're only looking at finances every year, it's like looking backwards and you're just looking in the rearview mirror. You're not looking at the road in front of you and whether you're navigating where you're going. So that's why finance is absolutely critical because that is what tells you whether you're make or break, whether you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. It all shows up in your numbers. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I mean, before my business went under, it's quite quite embarrassing when I look back at it now, but I literally used to look, get my numbers from my accountant in this nice little file, in this little like bound 10-page um, kind of book, and that I'd get that at the end of every year, and it'd be like, great, Hen Henry, you've made X amount of money, and you now owe that amount of tax. Here you are. See you again next year. And looking back now, I'm like, 
how did I how did I do that for 10 years? Um, it seems crazy because actually I think what I was prone to do because I didn't know my numbers is business can be quite simple if you try and spend your way out in the sense that a problem happens. OK, well, I'll go and buy X or a problem happens. I'll go and spend that on marketing. But I was doing it all without any knowledge. So I was trying to spend my way out of problems all the time and there wasn't the budget there. Yeah. It's, but you no, know, you're not alone. A lot of people you know, don't know what to do with their accounts. And, and the fact is, numbers just in isolation don't mean anything. You need, a, you need a context. And that's why a budget is really useful. So if you have a budget and you plan it on a monthly basis and you think where you should be and then you compare where you actually are, then you can see, okay, why... You look at the why. You ask yourself questions about why you are not on budget or why you are ahead of budget or below budget because it's really, really useful to help you decide what action to take because what you want to do is do more of the good stuff. Go like, oh, I had more sales. So why were my sales really good? Was it something that I did or was it just market conditions that I can exploit and try and find those market conditions again? So it's really understanding the reason why things are so that you can take effective action. And I call it, you know, it's a bit like pulling on a rope. You want to be able to pull on the rope to have the right effect rather than keep tugging on a rope and have lots of slack or you're pulling on the wrong rope. So that's why it's coordinated. You, you know, that's why budgets, that's why businesses um, you know, bigger businesses have in-house what they call management accountants because they look at the numbers and they explain why the business did what it did, good or bad. Yeah, yeah, absolutely love that. So you would say that having like a company metric sheet would work to where you can see all your numbers? Yeah. So, you know, at the end of the day, at the end of the, every month, you know, so the bigger businesses have like the management accounts and they, you know, the management accounts have to report to the, you know, the, the, the department heads or the CEOs or CFOs or whatever as to what the numbers were and what the interpretation of that number was. It's like, well, um, you know, so for example, when I was um, doing um, banking, all our profit was dependent on interest rates. But I would have spent that entire year um, explaining the fact that the bank interest rates hadn't gone up. That's why we didn't hit the profit that we budgeted. So we would then re-forecast that, the fact that we're not going to do budgets with um, anticipated interest rates. So, you know, you could do a budget saying, I'm going to launch a new product. And then you don't launch a product. And so you know that your revenue didn't hit that for that reason. You didn't launch a product. Or you launched an amazing product and it was way better than, than you thought it was going to be. And say, hey, I can launch this out to like, you know, 20% more clients. And so you go like, yeah, it really worked. I've got to really push this out. So it's enabling you to take really good action. Yeah, absolutely love that. Um, and as a business, as a small business, because um, sometimes I think people find this all quite overwhelming, what do you think are the main three numbers that, that a small business should be tracking? Just, you know, every, every day or every week or whenever it is, what are the main numbers that we need to be tracking in, in our businesses? Every business should have a cash flow forecast. And don't get that mixed up with a cash flow statement, which is part of the statutory accounts. It's just like... I don't find that particularly useful, but cash flow forecast basically is a is a mock up of what you think your bank balance will look like, what your cash position will look like, and it's it's a, essentially a live document because what it is is like your opening balance of the following month will be what your closing balance is for this month. So we forecast it and say where are we now? We'll forecast it for April, and then we think what our cash movements, cash cash coming in, cash going out will look like at the end. Well, during April will be changing all those numbers because it's never 100% accurate. So you change it, but then because it's a closing balance, it's live, it feeds through, you then see what the impact is going to be six months down the line. So if a customer defaults and, you know, it's a significant chunk of your income and they default, they go bust, what impact does that have on your cash flow? Does that mean you don't have the cash to pay for your VAT in three months' time? Does it mean you can't pay your corporation tax in three months' time? Will you be able to afford to hire somebody that you want to grow your team. That's what's really important because then you can see and anticipate how much cash you think you will have in the business. And it also shows what you what you call the cash flow cycle, which is how long one pound takes to go out of your business but then come back into your business again. And you want to keep that cash flow cycle as short as possible. So you know you want to optimize the period that you don't pay your creditors, so your for your suppliers, but you want your debtors and your clients to pay you as fast as possible because the period that money is outside of your bank account needs to be minimized. Sure. And then that's I, a... I, um, 
Yeah, I absolutely love that cash flow because, and I just want our listeners to know because they probably hear me banging on about this but all the time and um, my mentees that I've, me and Julie have not spoke before this and I always say the number one thing to track is cash flow forecaster. So absolutely. I'm so glad you've number said one, that. Number, number one, number one, number one. Because a little story, um, did last summer we lost money for a couple of months in a row um, just because summer's quieter in our tree surgery business. But I, my cash flow forecaster, I saw three months ahead that we were going to have a downturn in cash. We were going to have a deficit that I was like, okay, well, what do I do? Um, and we had a big bit of kit that we were we could sell that we didn't really use anymore. It was a big tractor. And because I could see three months ahead, I thought, okay, well, now I can put it out for sale. So I went and got it valued um, and it was like 45,000. And I went and spoke to a dealer and he said, I'll give you 25 grand for it. And I was like, no way, I'm not going to sell it that cheap. So I put it up for sale I got some tire kickers coming around and eventually we sold it for 42 I think 42 42 and a half thousand so nearly full valuation which I was like great money came in you know that helped us through the summer we've now had an amazing winter um actually record breaking winter so I'm very happy about that um but the point of the story is, is that if I hadn't a cash flowed and I had got to that point where I had that deficit, I would have had to sell the tractor. I'd have had to gone to the dealer, take the 25 grand because I needed to sell it quickly. And I would have lost out on, you know, £20,000 worth of, 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 of asset there. That is a perfect example as to why you, know, you need to cash flow. And so you basically you create a cash flow for 12 months. And I would recommend that you redo it every quarter so that you have at least nine to 12 months of runway ahead of you so you can see what's coming along because when you this is the whole point exactly that you can see when you're going to come short of cash what i call like you know come to a sticky patch and how do you then deal with it and then you if you go up you know you, you were able to sell an asset that you have and obviously you know you it wasn't a fire sale i've got to get like, get some cash in because you're desperate but also if you want to go get a bank loan your your credit history will look so much better before you go into having a low bank balance and the, you know, any creditor will think, okay, you're running quite cool, you know, and you'll get preferential interest rates on any loan that you take out and the options open to you will be far greater too. So yeah, absolutely perfect example, Henry, really perfect. And another client had the same thing because they could see that they were going to come, you know, again, it's about three or four months ahead. They saw that they, their business is going to get a bit sticky and it enables them to change course because you do not want to be like, imagine if you're driving, like this is the, the roadmap again. You don't want to be like a massive road swerve. You want to be able to do it gradually. It's much better journey than doing a massive road swerve and go like, mm, definitely, definitely. Absolutely love that. So if people are, people are doing the cash flow, what's the next number they need to be? Um... Uh, basically, it's a profit and loss. You need to make sure that in the profit and loss, you know that you are making, well, there's, there's two profit numbers. One is gross profit, which is literally the sale, the revenue, less the actual cost of sale. And what a cost of sale is like a cost that is directly incurred because you made a sale. So if you are, um, for example, your tree surgery business, you had to, um, you know, your, your uh, travel cost to get to somewhat for your client fuel, that is, if you didn't do that job, you would not incur it. Yeah. If you had to, and the, and the thing is with labor, it's is, is difficult to, for people to understand. If you've got people on your payroll and you pay them irrespective of whether you have a, um, a job or not, that is not a cost of sale. But if you bought in a specific contractor, especially to do that job, that is a cost of sale because you, did, you had to employ that person specifically for that job. If you didn't have that job, you wouldn't have employed them. So that is not a cost of sale. But somebody who is on your payroll, you pay them irrespective, that becomes a fixed cost. So that's understand that when you're you know, pacing, you know, pricing your jobs. So your gross profit shows whether your business is profitable, what the jobs you're doing are profitable. So gross profit, you need to make sure that you're selling lots of products and services which have a high profit margin. Yeah. And then your net profit is when you take away all your fixed costs, which are like, you know, your stand, you know, owner costs or um, your equipment and things like that. Those are your fixed costs. You pay them irrespective of whether you have any income coming in. So be mindful of your gross profit, your fixed costs and your net profit. Yeah. So if a, if a business is making good gross profit and their jobs are working, they're making money, but they're making a loss, then they're obviously their overheads, their fixed costs, you know, what they're what is costing to run the business is the is the place that they need to, to work on. They need to make. Yeah. So they need to work on either their fixed costs. And if their fixed costs are still not being covered by their gross profit, then there's something wrong in the metric They're either 
the cost of delivery of that service is either too high or they're not charging enough. So you've only got two levers to pull. One is the, the, is the price you're charging. And if the market doesn't bear an, a price lift, it puts you out of the market and you're charging, they say, 50% more, then there's something wrong with your delivery. Yeah, yeah, you're spending too much basically on, yeah, yeah, you know, that's what I used to have. I used to have a really fancy, nice yard and we had lots of, you know, stuff and looking back at it, we were spending too much on 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 that part of it we didn't need all this nice shiny yard when actually we could have been doing it at probably like you know 25 percent less um so yeah that was that's a really great way to explain it because i always try and explain gross profit and net profit to people and i've never explained it as well as that so um, oh, thank you. i'm definitely going to be getting my mentees and we like you need to listen to this episode this is really important um so because i think going back to referring back to tree surgery because obviously that's one of the industries that i'm in Quite a few people are always very nervous about putting their prices up, but yet we put our prices up quite a lot and we people still pay us. And I think that's, if you don't know that information, then you, you're never going to be confident to put your prices up, are you? Yeah. It's, 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 you know, when you run a business, you have to be constantly looking around you. And I know, you know, too much comparison can be very sort of psychologically damaging, but there's also being aware of the competition and the environment in which you exist. Because you're going to, you know, this is why big businesses can go bust because they don't see that there's like you no know, little little competitors co coming in on the inside and what how can they deliver it at such a premium, you know? Uh, but you know, pricing is always a very elastic thing. You need to make sure that you're covering your costs, essentially your cost of delivery and your fixed costs. And what you look at is uh, when you look at your gross profit per say contract, and you go, okay, how many contracts? Do I need to sell in order to cover my fixed costs? And so that bit is called a contribution. So if you say, okay, for example, my fixed costs are a thousand pounds and my um, gross profit per project is a hundred pounds, I need to sell ten contracts in order to cover my fixed costs. And that's a point at which my business is breaking even. I literally cover my costs and my and my revenues uh, exactly. And that's when you go into profit and go like, okay, if I sell ten, I'm breaking even. If I sell twelve. I'm then into the profit arena. Yeah. And then, you know, so, but pricing is very elastic. You need to make sure you cover your costs. And then it's like how much the market will bear. So I call it a bit of a trombone effect. So, you know, you try how much do you slide the slider out? And then that becomes, that then goes into the territory of um, marketing, brand building. Because why do people pay £100 for a pair of um, Nike trainers or pay £1,000 for a pair of Balenciaga trainers? Yeah, yeah. It's about the branding. Because it's not about the, it's no longer about the cost at that point of Balenciaga. It's all about the branding and who I've got in to do that. So you know, this is when you start building a very good reputation around your your business. About <clears throat> you're reliable, you do a good job, you don't just turn up. You turn up when you say you're going to. You clear up the mess afterwards. That's where your reputation really starts kicking in. Absolutely love that. Yeah, and it makes so much sense because the quality of the train is probably not much difference, is it? But it's just the fact that they've marketed and they've put themselves in a position in the market where they're saying we are the kind of bling expensive trainer to wear. So we're going to go out and charge that and then make a make a serious profit. Right. Um, Oh, that's amazing. So if anyone's struggling right now um, with their profit and loss or not understanding it or not even getting it from their accountant, um, because quite often it's done a lot of accountants do it quarterly because they just say, oh, we'll do it quarterly. And because it's the, that's when we've got to do the VAT return. What would you say to a business owner of how to challenge their accountant or, or how to get that information out, out of them? Basically, ask them the question, say, can you explain to me what I can do with my business? Ask them what the number means. Get, you know, ask them as if you were in school and they're a teacher because they are in a position of being a teacher. And if they don't answer you in a way that you understand, go find another accountant because there are a lot of bad accountants out there. And also know what your accountant does and what they're qualified to do because accountants, unlike the law profession, anybody can call themselves accountants. Even bookkeepers sometimes call themselves accountants. And there's a difference between what bookkeeping is, what an accountant does, what a tax accountant does. So a bookkeeper literally is administrative. They put all your numbers in the right bucket so that when you look at it, it's like filing. It's like financial filing to me. That's what I call bookkeeping. Accountants then put it into um, the, sort of the legal form where you have to file your accounts to HMRC and to company's house. And the tax accountant really is the, the proper person that really knows the tax legislation, how to save you tax, you know, making sure that you've got to so hopefully having the right strategy about when you spend your money, whether you can get um, allowances to save yourself when you're you know, investing in, 
equipment, especially with, you know, the industry of tree surgery, planter machinery, what grants you can get, they should be the ones that can help you. And if somebody can't answer the question that you're asking them, find somebody else who can. Yeah, amazing. Love that. I say that to people all the time. And um, I'm glad you highlighted that because I've experienced a lot of bad accountants and I've always wondered why. But is that because it's not regulated that literally anyone can be an accountant? No, 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 not no. You have them. You, they are qualifications. So there's ACCA, which is what you call the certified accountants. Um, that's a worldwide qualification. Um, it's probably the biggest body. No, it's the biggest body worldwide. But I, I'm personally, I'm a chartered accountant. I'm going to advocate, you know, being chartered accountant. But those chartered accountants are real, what I call bean counters, and they're quite really into the numbers and not always commercial. What you want is find an, a business a accountant, ACCA or ACA or C, whatever it is. But they have to be able to understand the commercial translation of what that number actually means. And if they can't translate it in the language that you understand, they may not understand it themselves. They may not get behind your business. And so what I do is I get behind and understand what drives tree surgery businesses, what drives your costs, what drives your revenue, how do you find your clients? And if they can't have that kind of conversation with you, then maybe find somebody else that can. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So um, what I tend to come across a lot in the accountancy world is is that you have a, an accountant who will do the bookkeeping as well, but it very much feels like that a lot of accountants take on lots of customers, but then they don't have the time to do it all. Um, so what we've, what's worked for us in the last couple of years is we have a bookkeeper and then an accountant and we keep them separate. Sometimes they work together in the same office, but they're two different people. Is that is that more advisable to do it that way? Well, bookkeepers is essentially like filing. So it's so a, an accountant may offer you bookkeeping services, but usually it's delegated out to a bookkeeper because the bookkeepers have their own qualifications as well, and they're the ones that are you know putting things in the right buckets. But the accountant should be the one that helps you with the interpretation of things. Some I mean I I know an amazing bookkeeper, and she will come back to you and say, you know, why do you know you no know, to the, the business owner, you know, why has this number gone up or down? Because she won't know what the action went behind that number, and if she's asking you that question, you want them to ask you that question or, or and something like that. So I I saw somebody's accounts and an accountant basically you know, the rent on her chain of um, hairdressing businesses was going up and down, and rent should be static. So why an accountant was not even evening that out? or not even questioning and saying, why is that going lumpy? Begs the question, what were they doing? Because you should be looking out for patterns. Yeah, sure, sure. So when doing um, a profit and loss for a business, um, if someone's got a small business and they've got an accountant, they've got a bookkeeper, when is a realistic time frame from the end of a month to the point of when you should know your profit and loss? Um, this should be agreed with your bookkeeper or accountant as to when you get your numbers, because the whole point of having your numbers is to be able to take action. You know, if something is leaking, you want to be able to turn off that, that tap as soon as possible. Or if something's really good, you want to go, you know, if it's the, the sun's come out, you want to go sell ice cream now, not tomorrow. You want to sell it now. So usually it's within the week of the month end. So sometimes, say, for example, we, we close at the, um, after the month end and you need to get your receipts, invoices over to your bookkeeper say within three days, then they say may they, they, they may have like five working days in which to turn those numbers around and get them back to you. So definitely before mid month. But uh, if you can get it within 10 days, working 10, 10 days, that would be ideal. But it depends on how effective your business is. And you know, if you are not a fast moving business, it might not really matter to you. But seriously, within it's reasonable within about, you know, by mid mid month, like working day fifteen or something like that, you know. I'm glad you said that because that's what we do. Is by the fifteenth of every month, we know the previous month. Um, but but we also put in forecast projections, so we have a week. We track the weekly invoicing that we do because we know we've got a set target for like a hundred thousand pounds for the month, and so we'll know each week we need to do twenty five twenty twenty five k, and we'll kind of know that the month's been good. And if we've a bit short, even by the month end, but then we wait for the real the real numbers to come through on the back end. It's essentially a bookkeeper. Quite, I mean, if you get to know your bookkeeping system, it's, it's, this is where you, you know a business owner ought to get to know a certain amount of stuff. So if they've got bookkeeping software, my favourite is Xero. Um, it's quite intuitive and you'll see that if you're raising your invoices and, you're, and it's automated, those invoices will be within your system. So you can see, you know, what number your, your sales number will be. And then you'll see whether the money's coming because it'll be linked to your bank account and which invoices have been paid, which will be outstanding. It's for you to go in and have a little bit of a nosy and see what, what's, what's going on. The bookkeeper at the end of the month, for month end, should be just like going, okay, 
we've got a few jobs that we haven't um, billed for yet. We'll just bring those numbers into this month. And then we've got a few invoices which we haven't put into the system yet. We'll bang those in and we think we've got something we haven't had the invoices in for yet, but we'll bang them into this month because it's applicable for this month. Those are the tweaks that the bookkeeper will be doing for you essentially. But if your system is automated, a lot of your, your numbers will probably be about 80% correct. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, I've got QuickBooks for the for the two of the businesses and I've got zero for the property businesses and they're both really easy to use. I can log in, I can see month by month my profit and loss, I can see the balance sheet and things like that. And then we have a separate spreadsheet which is more of a, like you talked about, the cash flow forecast or it's more of a we we track it weekly and it's a bit more of a of a running running thing rather than it being a static static sheet um so we talked about profit and loss talked about cash flow what's the third number third one balance sheet know what your balance know know what your business is worth um at any moment in time so i talk about the balance sheet and the profit and loss being like a married couple you know what happens to one affects the other they, they kind of like, and it's like a bit of like a sandwich. So a balance sheet is at a moment in time. So at the beginning of the year, say on the 1st of January, if you've got a year end of December, the 1st of January, my business is worth X amount. I'm worth like, I don't know, 5,000 pounds, for example. And then at the end of the year, for the 12 months, um, for say 2023, I've made 50 grand. If I hadn't spent anything, um, I say, for example, I, I invoiced like 60,000, but I spent 10,000. I've made 50,000 pounds net profit after tax. So I should be effectively worth another 50 grand. So you basically, it's a sandwich. My opening balance sheet plus my profit and loss for this year gives me my closing balance sheet for the end of the year. So it's a sandwich. That's how the things are related. And so what am I worth? So if you're growing your business, that is a sign of your business growing because incrementally your balance sheet will be growing. Yeah, yeah, amazing. And what are the dangers of not knowing your balance sheet? You're running at a deficit and also knowing the components of your, but where your value sits. If you are a uh, very um, uh, fixed asset, so lots of your value is sitting in fixed assets. If something comes up, you don't have the liquid assets like cash or debtors to convert, then that's a dangerous place to be in because you, you, you that, so business can go under for lack of liquidity, not for lack of value. So, you know, a profitable business could be something like a property business. You may be building a massive, amazing development building or whatever. It may be profitable, but if you haven't got the cash to have in place to pay for the building materials or the laborers, you could go under. So a lot of businesses go under, not for lack of um, valuation, but lack of cash. Yeah, I've, I, so yeah being aware of that. I've definitely said that to people before. You can have a very profitable business but no cash and it'll go under and you could have a very unprofitable business but you've got a good running cash flow and you keep going because actually that's what I did for about two years and I didn't realize because I didn't even the danger I had with my balance sheet is I didn't even know we were in a minus like I was that blase of my numbers I didn't know it and in the end it got me in a lot of trouble um, as a director because I was running an insolvent business for a while which obviously you can't um, you can't put your creditors in a worse position by running that business insolvent so um yeah, it's a really important number to know, isn't it? Really important number to know. It's just knowing that it's just a language of understanding it. And once you get to grips with it. So, you no, know, the most important thing is the cash, because that is the oxygen to your business. You, do, you want to know how much is in the tank. You don't be gasping for air and go like, oh, my God. So managing the cash is really important. But knowing the fact that your business is worth something so that when you retire or when you want to sell your business, that's why you kind of really want to know the valuation of your business. You know, how much how, what's the multiple of what you sell your business for somebody comes say like you know um you know a, a bigger tree surgery company wants to come and acquire your your business you need to know what it's worth and where your value sits definitely which is sometimes that's what that's what people do is to exit their business you know they have a plan of five years they want to get it to x amount and they want to exit and and move on don't they so um yeah absolutely love that i mean this has been brilliant julie thank you so much so tell me what do you do now what is it that you do and how do you help business owners and, and is there a particular niche of businesses that you help or are you helping all businesses i help all businesses i have a lot of service-based businesses so my mission is to take the fear out of finance make it approachable help people empower people to understand what makes their business tick because if you're not in control of your finances you're not technically in control of your business so this is where I'm trying to help people, help them to roadmap, create the strategy, understand what they need to do, help to track their businesses and give them the advice and say, actually, you're running off on the wrong road. You know, you're going off the track or the track that you thought you were going on. Maybe there's a better there's a better road to your destination. So it really is trying to help business owners get to their destination of their, whatever their business goals are. I want to be the person sitting, the accountant, not sitting 
opposite them, but going like, how can I help you? What are we doing? Kind of, I have feel like I have a vested interest because I want to make their business as su- successful as possible. Yeah, and how we how how do you do that with people? So we'll sit down, strategize, understand where the finances are, make sure that they have the right support behind them, the right accountants, the right bookkeepers, get their system set out so that they get the right information, so they have it to hand. Make sure it's analysed correctly. So you know you're not having to break if you've got lots of different kinds of products or lots of different channels that you sell your products through. You want the information separate it out so that when you go like, okay, Henry, what was your biggest selling client? You know, where did your biggest clients come from? What's the greatest service that you sell? You want to have the information to hand and go like, I can make that decision. So helping you have the right information to hand to make the right decision. So get that foundation set up and then, so that you're running, ticking over, then I will have like regular catch ups with you on a monthly or quarterly basis, depending on, you know, how the speed of your business runs, making sure that you are on track. So just guiding you. I'm, I'm going to help you set the guide rails for your business and be the, I don't know, the ear yeah. to hear what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And and where you talked about budgets at the in the beginning. Where does the budgets play into all of this? Is that something you help people with, or or do you do you give F, is there FD support that comes along with it? So I'm also what you call a fractional finance director. So for some companies where they don't need a full-time finance director or full-time in-house person, I'm that kind of person that helps add the strategic management account bit that businesses don't always have in-house. It's not always easy to get to because, you, I mean, if you think about it, you set up your business, but how do you compare to a big corporate that actually has an accountant in-house? There is a gap in between that, and I try to fill that gap by going like, well, I'm here to give you the strategic bit, help you work out, you know, I have a new product I want to bring out, I have a new service, how does that work? And I can sit there and go like, well, we can map out what, what the revenue might be from that, what the cost of delivering that might be, and then add that onto what we call, what I call it BAU, business as usual, some call it baselining, you know, what's your normal business and how, what does this new project then add to your business in terms of revenue? What does it do to your balance sheet? What does it do to your profit and loss? So, you know, I will be that sounding board, either one-off projects on a regular basis, just to be that person that helps you understand what your actions actually have as an impact on your business love that love absolutely love that so do you love a spreadsheet julie do you know what i didn't used to love a spreadsheet but about two years ago i kind of like that the penny dropped as like you know i can work out how the spreadsheets can work for me now but yeah you, i mean as a business owner you need to learn how to work at least a basic spreadsheet because you're not you want to be adding numbers up on paper if you can work at you know, basic principles of working a spreadsheet there's so much help that it will give you it will be you know it will be life-changing yeah yeah I, I must admit I used to hate spreadsheets years ago I mean I was I was terrible with score failed everything but now I've got even looking on my screen now I've got five Google sheets across the top for the different businesses which have got metric sheets which I literally look at daily and check the numbers and and it's really nice to be able to see what what everything's doing and be able to track everything so yeah I learned to love spreadsheets and I think every business need, owner needs to learn to love you spreadsheets. need to you need to yeah because because spreadsheets will help you model out so it's like it's it's your numerical play-doh yeah. you model out what it will look like and you go like oh i don't really like that it doesn't look and you, you and you play with another number and see what what happens to, to make that happen so yeah learn learn to use a bit of a spreadsheet because it helps you see what okay if i raise my prices by two percent what does that do to my revenue what does it do to, what happens if some of my prices go up by five percent what does that do to my business you can see that because you can't play that out in your head. You have to see that out in numbers. You're like, oh my God. And when you see it in numbers, it will make you know what action to take. Yeah, absolutely love that because quite often people are really nervous about putting their prices up because they think they're going to lose work. But uh, but a lot of these people that won't put their prices up are not probably paying themselves a lot of money. So if they can actually see that, they can see a correlation between actually, if I just you know get on with this and put my prices up, they're going to be able to see that in actual real terms, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, if you say, for example, you put your prices up and say, okay, I put my prices up by 5%. Will I lose customers? Okay, then you factor that in and go like, okay, if I put my price up by 10%, but I lose 5% of my customers or 20% of my customers, what does that do to my bottom line? Does that mean I can have more of the customers I want to work with, get rid of all the ones that I don't like working with? You can understand that sometimes raising your prices may not necessarily mean a drop in your revenue. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed that we we raised our prices a couple of times over the last couple of years, and we've not we've not dropped lost customers. We've actually it means that we've improved profit. It means it's better for the staff. We've paid staff more. We've got more kit. You know everything. It just it makes it all work so much easier, doesn't it? Um, I think um, 
one thing I read years ago in a book, I think it was called Change or Switch by Chip and Dan Heath. And they talk about how we make a lot of decisions with our emotion. Um, and I love now the fact that um, when I'm looking at my numbers, it's feeding in to my to my thinking part of my brain and it helps me make those calculated decisions because we all make decisions with emotion don't we but actually knowing your numbers helps you make the right decisions with your emotions it, it does it does make it it's visual then it's not something that's an emotional thing and you go oh well you're scared of the number when you see it and you go okay but can i do anything about that it's like looking in the mirror when you want to lose weight you're going to see us you've got to own up to what the problem or or, the, or you know or, or what the nice side will be yeah definitely yeah and exactly that because you've got to see that real stuff and sometimes it might not be it might not be pleasant reading but it means you can do something and prove it i think is it peter drucker who says what gets um, measured gets improved um and you can't improve prove anything if you're not measuring because you're just sort of you know you're just stabbing in the dark aren't you yes and it's knowing what the action will actually take so you no know, i said earlier on about you know knowing your numbers and it, cause it just helps you manipulate it and because you can't measure your goal without numbers you can't measure words how do you measure words yeah and and people say oh i want to be 10 million pounds in in 10 years but you know you, how do you get there you've got to work back then haven't you with those numbers and and put that in place yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, I love it. The fact that, you know, you, you, you're a living example of what I what I think somebody should do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it took I, I learned the hard way. You know, I really did learn the hard way of losing it all. And that's kind of what I what, when, when we were chatting um, uh, at Nick's and I was just like, I've got to get Julie on because, you know, I can keep on harping on to the world. But it's really great to get you on and someone that's got the experience of the numbers and really explain things in, in a, in a lot better way than I can. But you know, it's, 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 um, I'm living proof that numbers are important, but also it's really important to be able to, to teach this. So, um, Julie, if people want to work with you, how would they, how would they find you? Um, I'm happy to share my details. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, my email, you know, I think maybe find me on LinkedIn. Yeah, what I'll do um, is I'll put your details in the show notes. Um, so this has been such a great episode. I've really enjoyed having you on, Julie. Have you got any um, final words that you'd like to say about numbers or, or to our audience? Yeah, well, numbers is basically people don't always come to speak to an accountant because it's it's a pain. You know, the immediate addressing, uh, immediate problem they want to address is marketing, sales. But actually finance is something that they don't feel the pain of until it's too late. So I'm a bit like the dentist. People don't go and see their dentist until they've got a problem. So think of like speaking to a dentist, knowing what your, your general, you know, it's like cleaning your teeth, flossing your teeth. Managing your numbers is a bit like that. It's will avoid a bigger pain further along the line. Know what you need to do. Absolutely love that. Thanks, Julie. And if someone is struggling with their accountant right now and they're really just not getting the information out, out, out of them and it's really they're just hitting a bit of a brick wall, what would your biggest bit of advice be to someone that's struggling with their current accountant? To speak to another accountant and actually when you ask them you know when you're interviewing accountants ask them you know what kind of services they offer what level of communication and involvement in your business they are able and willing to do because i know some accountants they just don't have the capacity to understand your business so understand what they deliver in terms of you know, we call it a service level agreement what you get for your money and what they're able to do tell them what your problem is and what your expectation is from them and you, they need to be able to educate you um, around what is important and say, you know, are you able to flag up any, um, any problems in my business or things like that? Because sometimes people think, well, I don't get to see your business, so I can't tell you that. And some people have the expectation that um, they want their accountants to tell them that their grants are available. But, well, the accountant doesn't know that you want those services. So it's a bit of a communication thing. So it definitely is a two-way thing. It's not the onus isn't only on the business owner and the onus is only on the accountant. Yeah, it's got to be the right right relationship. And, and, it, and the cards have got to be laid out on the table at the beginning of what, what the expectations are for, for both of them, right? Absolutely. Cool. Amazing. Do you know what, Julie, this has been such a great episode. Thank you so much for coming on um, and sharing all of your knowledge on numbers. Um, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to to meeting up with you again in the future. Yeah. Thank you very much. It'd be really cool. So I hope everybody starts loving numbers. Yeah, definitely. Well, you've got, you've got, if you're in business, you've got to love numbers because they will be your best friend. They might challenge you to start off with, but once you get on top of them and they're improving, then they're going to be your best friend, aren't they? You know, I was speak, speaking to the, um, the lady who started up um, Not On The High Street, uh, Sophie, yesterday, and she said, brand numbers, brand numbers. She said that was her thing. Yeah, love it. Absolutely love it. Thanks for coming on, Julie. Really appreciate you. Thank you very much, Henry. Appreciate that.